What is up, everybody? I hope everybody is having a great night, ready for some 49er football talk. And there were some interesting things that came out of the owners' meetings this week, not just 49ers related, but related to the NFL, some of the rule changes. We got to talk about that. Really, the main thing that I want to talk about, though, the main topic is Kyle seems more content with the O-line than what we had hoped. I'll just leave it at that. I've got some quotes from today's meetings, but it will cover it in depth. That being said, we got a lot to talk about, and we're going to do it all next. All right, welcome back to Last Second Sports, where we are giving you our take down to the last second. And it's Tuesday night, which means I got my guy so real, Sunil in the building. What's up, Sunil? You know, out here living the dream, even though it's not all every Tuesday night, you got so real, Sunil. But, you know, if I'm on the show, it's probably a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mo most likely a Tuesday. Most likely a Tuesday. <laughs> Gosh. Are you talking about me or Kyle? I'm confused, Orlando. I don't <laughs> Is it my arrogance or Kyle's arrogance? I'm not really sure. I don't know how to take that one, but I'm going to assume it's Kyle's arrogance, I hope. I don't know. I guess we'll figure it out. But happy to have you back, Sunil. I know that we took a one-week hiatus last week. You were traveling, and then I thought I was doing another show, and then I wasn't, and then about, you know, whatever. No big deal. You're back. Excited to see you. Glad you're back on Last Second yes, Sports. Sir. Yes, sir. You looking slim and trim, my guy. You've been working. I've been out? working. I've been working, man. I've, Part I've of some dropped, of them calories. I've dropped since probably Thanksgiving. I've probably dropped thirty pounds. Wow. Yeah. Hey, congratulations. Yeah, I'm on the way down, That's man. Huge. Thank That's you. Huge. Thank you, man. Thank you. And it's also the white. The white makes you look slimmer. When you wear the black, it's like it's built into the seat. So then I look extra wide because the seat <laughs> looks like it's my body. Right. But yeah, I'm, I'm trying, man. I've been working. I've been working. So, hey, man, we, uh, we want, especially as we get up there in age, man, we got to focus on your fitness because uh, it only gets harder from here. <laughs> Dude, it's not easy. It is not easy. But also, it's it's also the the health aspect, right? I'm married. I got a beautiful wife. I got great kids. All that. It's not the look aspect. It's the health aspect. I don't I don't want to go down because like I just want to be a fat guy. Let me let me get healthy and sure. try to live as long as I can. You know what I mean? Absolutely, man. We got years to we got years to do this show, bro. We got to be well <laughs> into our nineties. Still talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did, did the remember the good old days <laughs> are we in the good old days right now and we don't realize it maybe we hey. are you know what maybe you've had it right the whole time praising kyle shanahan these are the good old days and we're gonna look back on it and remember and you were right the whole time maybe that's a possibility hey i hope so <laughs> check back in 2050 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll still be doing the damn thing. All right. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some of these NFL rule changes. There was a lot of little rule changes, but the four that I pulled from all the rule changes that I think are the most notable is one, the hip drop tackle is gone. So Jimmy Ward, you might want to retire. That's your whole game. <laughs> he actually put out a funny clip saying that this is the end for him. The challenge rule got tweaked a little bit. So before it was, you had to get both of your challenges right in order to challenge a third time. Now, if you get one of your two challenges right, you can get a third challenge. So that's kind of a nice little tweak. I, I never understood. I, I understand limiting it because you don't want to slow down the game. But at the same time, if there's legitimately something to challenge, I feel like you should be able to challenge it within reason. So I like that rule change. The trade deadline got moved back one week, which I think makes a lot of sense because they've added an extra week to the NFL season. So I like that. And then the final rule, the biggest rule is the kickoff rule, which changed drastically. It looks just like the XFL did, which I thought was entertaining for those of you that watched any XFL football, probably not a ton of you in the chat, but maybe you watched a little bit. 
I like the kickoff rule, and I think that there's some mixed feelings on this one in particular. Sunil, out of all the rule changes, which one stood out to you the most? And I'll also add this. The 49ers were one of three teams. It was them, the Packers, and someone else. I think it might have been the Raiders voted against the kickoff rule change. Anyways, what are your thoughts on some of the rule changes? Yeah, I mean, I think the kickoff change is going to be interesting. Um, I think there's room for that to actually be a deciding factor in some games. Um, Not only, you know, because I think it gives uh, kick returners a chance to actually like run it back now because it's not always going to go be a touchback. But, you know, now your kicker is going to be a lot more in play late in games, right? Like, because you have to get it in that drop zone. Otherwise there's, you know, there could be some, you know, yardage. I think it goes out to the 40 if you don't get in the drop zone or if you kick it all the way into the end zone, then, you know, it comes out to, you know, the 30. But it, you could gain some extra yards if your kicker isn't um, accurate with, with those kick kick returns or, or with those kickoffs. So I think that's going to be intriguing. Obviously the hip drop, I know why the, the, the league is doing it because it did cause some injuries. Um, and I know – everybody's kind of up in arms, especially on the defensive side. Oh, you're making it even harder for us to play defense. But I feel like we say that every time they make a defensive change, um, as far as the way they could tackle and the rules and all that kind of stuff. And by the next season, we forgot all about it. So um, it is unfortunate. I, I think obviously defense is getting harder and harder to play, but ultimately these guys are making millions of dollars playing a game. They'll figure it out. Um because defense is still going to be important, right? So, yeah, I mean, overall, I didn't think, I don't, I, the kickoff one I think is going to be the most impactful because it's completely different. And usually um, there's going to be a team that figures out the strategy before the other teams, and then it's going to be like copycat. But it's going to be interesting, at least for this season, because some team's going to come up with a unique way to uh, utilize it as strategy. And then, you know, we get to go from there. Well, what I find interesting about this rule is one of the early conversations I think we had this offseason, we talked about special teams and we reiterated the point that we like Debo to return kicks. You said it and then I piggyback on like, yeah, absolutely. We talked about Ayuk maybe with the punts, but Debo returning kicks, absolutely more so than ever. If you look at the way that this thing is set up, the players can't move until the ball is caught or fielded by the player. So that makes it very safe for the players. Debo's a dynamic player. If you can get the ball in his hands and have it in a safer situation, I'm all for it. I would love to see Debo back there returning kicks. Yeah, and I think he gets a 10-yard head start on everybody else. So it's not like guys just with 30 yards of pure sprint going at him. It's going to be guys with only a 10-yard, and he's probably much faster than the guys – that are stronger than him that could bring him down. He's probably much stronger than the guys that are faster than him. So it's a unique combination. I mean, I think that definitely Debo could flourish in that. One thing that they had flirted with this year was a change to the onside's kick rule as well. They, they did change it in the fact that there's no more surprises, obviously, because the onside kick looks very different than the actual kickoff. But one thing they had talked about, and I wish they would have implemented with this change, was instead of an onside kick, you get the ball fourth and goal from the 20-yard line. And if you convert and you get in the end zone, you get the ball back. I wish they would have done that. I think that would have made it much more exciting than the onside kick, which I, I get both probably have a slim chance of conversion. But how much more fun would that be to see the offense on the field trying to get the ball back and earning the ball back? I would love for that to happen. Sure. Sure. I mean, right now, it's pretty much impossible to to get an onside kick. So, you know, anything that leads to better strategy, I think, makes the game more exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Brother Bob says, so we wasted a third on Moody? Damn it, Kyle. Maybe. (laughs) Uh, yeah, that was, that was the big thing. I I do remember when he got drafted and my reaction was not a positive one. Everybody in the chat said, well, I mean, he'll be able to put the ball in the end zone on kickoffs at least. Uh Uh-huh. 
uh, all right. He didn't <laughs> even we, really do that. Here we are. I know he didn't. <laughs> really do that to be honest he didn't really do that he had the leg for it it was what he was asked to do which was interesting very very interesting all right let's talk about another thing that came out of these owner meetings which was jed york becoming the principal owner of the team and i did talk a little bit about this yesterday but i like the way that you phrased the question just simply is this good or bad that he is the principal owner of the team what are, what are your thoughts on this one yeah i mean i want to give props to um grant i think he asked some really great questions in that yeah. interview with with york and obviously from a fan's perspective you look at the answers that he gave and you know most most 49er fans are pretty diehard it's super bowl or bust and they want everybody in the organization to parrot that same uh sentiment but um to me, you know, I actually was fine with, with, with York. Obviously, you know, I don't think you you put out there that you're excited about losing the Super Bowl or you still consider it a successful year. Like, I don't think that necessarily is um, the right messaging. But I do think that he has fostered um, – he has fostered a, a culture here where the team is run very well. I think that, you know, they, even though he's owing that the teams have been Owen three in the Super Bowl, I think that to, to be consistently getting there gives you a chance, like he said. And he did mention that like, you know, we, we need to get over the hump. It's not okay to just continuously like lose. And, you know, when you think about what the owner actually controls, I think that he does um, fine. You know, I think he's gotten a couple of great coaches in here and Harbaugh and, and Shanahan. I think Lynch is, is the right guy. And, you know, we've seen this organization get cherry picked every single year, whether it be coaches or our front office staff and, you know, all of that, I think you got to give credit to, um, you know, whomever is at the top to, to foster that type of, you know, uh, culture here. Yeah. I mean, do we, is it good enough to just be runner up? No, I think ultimately you have to win a Super Bowl. but, um, I do think that the team right now is in a better space than the later years of when DeBartolo was the owner of the team. Um, but obviously, you know, he's always going to be judged by, the the golden years of the 49ers where they were winning super bowls you know five and oh and super bowls and whatnot all of those happened under a different owner um i think there's a lot worse owners than than york um you know but uh, ultimately until he's able to create a team that that's a champion you know he's always going to not be good enough for the 49er faithful yeah my my thing with york oh, I'm gonna mute you. That's super loud. What do, you, what do you got? Are you are you on a motorcycle right now? Is that what's happening? <laughs> nah, man. I live in downtown, so uh, if anybody speeds by here, <laughs> Sunil's on a motorcycle. Virtual background. That's crazy. No, but uh, Jed York. Here's the interesting thing about Jed York. I actually had a topic at some point this season, giving him a lot of credit for the way that he's turned the team around compared to some of the early years, and then to bounce back after the Harbaugh years. I think he did deserve credit for those things. Yes, the ultimate goal is to win a Super Bowl, but it's not that I think York is doing an awful job or is an awful owner even. I like York up until the point that he opens his mouth. It seems like every time he has something to say, he just insert foot in mouth. And today... He couldn't help himself. There was at least three separate occasions that he took a shot at Eddie DeBartolo. And for what? Because he was trying to protect the fact that they didn't win a Super Bowl. Every time it got tough or the heat was turned up on them not winning a Super Bowl, he'd go right back to taking a shot at DeBartolo. So I, one of the I, things... I saw your tweet about that, Jesse. Sorry, yeah. sorry to cut you off. What, what did you think were the shots he was taking? So one one of them was they asked him about how DeBartolo would get fired up and hit a wall or something after they lost a big game. He's like, well, you know, I could do those things, but 
it's really about being mature in those situations. I mean, what am I going to do to control or impact the game? I've got to be more calculated and mature. I'm like, okay, let me, you know, maybe that's a little shot. But when he said, well, it's not like when my uncle was the owner of this team and we could just pay whoever, whatever we wanted. I mean, if it was up to me, we would have just kept Eric Armstead and paid him whatever he wants. If we weren't in the salary cap era, I would have already paid Brandon Ayuk. If I could have had the two highest paid quarterbacks on the roster, you don't think I would do those things? Like, okay, dude, that's un completely unnecessary. Why even bring that up? Basically saying, the way I took that was, basically what you're saying is, his championships don't amount to anything because they could just spend whatever they want. And who cares about the culture? Who cares about the actual drafting of the great players that they did? None of that mattered. It's because they could spend whatever they want. So essentially, what I'm doing is really hard. You should give me the grace. I didn't like that at all. Yeah, I mean, one, he didn't use the tone of voice that you were saying all of those things. So that's a little well, bit. Well, of course I mean, not. But it, you, <laughs> and he was also asked. It was a question that was asked and he gave an answer. And yeah, but I mean, I think that I didn't I didn't take it that way. I, I, I actually saw your tweet and then watched the video. So I was mm. looking from the perspective of what your tweet was to see like, OK, where where did he take these shots? And then I saw him talking about DeBartolo. But I do think that I thought he was answering a question and what his point was is that the NFL is different now than it was then. So the business is different now than it was then. So like, I, I, I don't know. I didn't really take it as sharp shots at the Bartolo, but, um, but yeah, man, I, I get it. Like, I don't think his messaging was great from a fan's perspective. Like, I think that, you know, no, no fan wants to hear that, Hey, we had a successful year and, we you know lost the super bowl or you know the, nobody no fans want to hear about um what's it called moral victories and all this type of stuff right which is kind of the sentiment that that york was was putting in um but yeah ultimately why i think it, it, it's fine right now is just because i think he has the right pieces in place i know people argue with me on that but i think kyle shanahan is the right coach and ultimately i, I do think they get over the hump um you know with who they have in place right now. Well, and one of the things that I gave him credit for mid season, it might've been a show with you, Sunil, but I said something along the lines of, I like that for the most part, you don't hear from York. He's hired football guys, whether you agree if they're the right guys or not, that's kind of irrelevant, but he's chosen his football guys, Shanahan Lynch, and he stayed out of their way for the most part, allowed them to make the decisions. And I love it when owners do that. I hate when owners think they're the football guys and then they start making decisions. You look at the Panthers Jerry as a Jones. great example. Jerry Jones, yes. He's actually done a pretty decent job. But yeah, yes, he's like the main example. But the Panthers, you look at their situation, they brought in Young to be their quarterback because the owner wanted him. But rumors came out that the coach that they had hired that same offseason wanted CJ Stroud, they end up firing him mid season, essentially because you didn't see eye to eye on the quarterback. And ultimately you probably did take the wrong quarterback. That's how is that the coach's fault? So anyways, I like that he stays out of the way of the football guys and allows them to make their decisions. And I'm not saying, Hey, we shouldn't ever hear from the owner, especially at things like this. This is the owner's meeting. I get it. Dude, just be a little bit more, cognizant on the tone read the tone of the room read the room know what the expectations are and i did i love the fact that grant started that whole thing with a home run question which was you said years ago that you are here to win super bowls and if you don't basically it's a failure and to hold you accountable yet this year you talked about how it would was still a successful season even if you lost in the nfc championship game has your expectations changed? And I think York gave a good answer. I mean, he's matured. Things have changed. I get all of that. But some of it was just, I don't know. I took it as shots at DeBartolo. I know maybe you didn't or some other people didn't. That's how I took a lot of the things that he said. But maybe I just read into it differently. Yeah. I think the biggest thing, well, not the biggest, but one of the bigger things that I, I took from it was understanding because I think what the point he was he was trying to make is that like 
the the difference between where the four, this is the kind of the most interesting to me thing to me is like he believes that the 49ers would would be considered a dynasty if they had the right quarterback that was the biggest thing because he talked about you know the dynasties have Mahomes have uh have uh, Tom, Tom Brady. Brady but then he was like I don't know if Brock Purdy's ever gonna be as good as those guys that was kind of interesting because yeah you know obviously you know you know, then he talked about paying this guy and, and you know, how how he understood he's going to pay them, you know, $40, 50000000 million. Well, if you want to create a dynasty and you know you need the right quarterback to be able to do that, then, you know, do you stick with Purdy or do you try to keep searching for that right guy? I don't know. Um, so that's kind of interesting because it does seem like he understands that the business is different from the years that, the 49 because i guess what 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 the ultimate point that i think he was making was like back in the day with his uncle like you wouldn't lose a guy because you couldn't pay him you would choose if you want to keep this guy or not whereas now you have to make tougher decisions as far as roster building you can't just keep all the guys even if you you know you know that they're an asset or not right and that is that is accurate. Like I don't think that's you can argue that. But once again, I just think ultimately his messaging was wrong because he let fans that believe that he's not Super Bowl or bust continue to believe that he's not Super Bowl or bust, which I think ultimately he'll get criticism until they win a Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Abs but see, here's the other thing, and this is why I look at it as taking shots at DeBartolo, maybe in some of the scenarios that you don't. I can't get that quote out of my head from a year ago where the guys from the front office essentially called the old way of running things. They called them a lemonade stand. They've taken shots before. And they, I mean, any they, they all fall under York's ownership. So I imagine that if somebody in the front office speaks that way, that Jed York backs that up, so for me to hear this again, I said, ah, you're doing it again, Jed. You're a little bit bitter that you don't have your ring. Everybody looks at the gold standard as being before you got here. You have an ego. I think that plays a little bit in these press conferences. I do. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. All right, there we go. Brother Bob says, Sunil. Who likes losing except for <laughs> except for you? Dor is Dork York and Kyle Levy. I'm not gonna go that far. I'm not gonna call him a dork. I'm just saying he, you know. You're right, brother Bob. I enjoy losing. I you're right. That's, <laughs> Every, I, that, that's everything everything I've said is because I enjoy losing. You're right. <laughs> Everybody said that you're carrying water for the organization. They don't they don't like your take on this whole thing. Sure. Which is which is rare. Usually, it's me that they, they don't like my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about Brandon Ayuk because this doesn't seem to be going away. And Kyle talked about it again today. There's a lot of moving parts. It seems every time the organization comes out and says things are great, Ayuk then takes to Instagram and says maybe not so fast. One thing that was interesting today, and I'll throw in a, a little bit of a tidbit, a little bit of a background, and Marco, you can back me up on this because I showed you the messages. I'm not going to say who messaged me this because I don't want to say their name in case they don't want it out. And if they're here and they want credit, by all means, you can take it. But about 10 days ago, I got a message with some pictures from Cabo. And they said, hey, I I'm in Cabo, York, Lynch and Shanahan are right next to me. Ayuk just came up from the ocean with a bunch of his friends, acted as if he didn't see Shanahan or any of them and walked past him. And then Lynch said something to the effect of, wow, this just got a little bit more awkward for him. Well, fast forward to today. The reason that's important is because some people spun what Shanahan said today where he said, yeah, I saw Ayuk in Cabo and I see him around the building. One thing he didn't say is that he talked to Ayuk. And he did also mention that he felt like maybe Ayuk didn't want to see them in Cabo, which kind of 
coincides with what I had heard around 10 days ago from the gentleman that was in Cabo when they were there. So all of that added in for context and everything that's going on. What do you think overall of this IUK situation? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's as nefarious as people okay. think it is. I think oh, hold that, on. I, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You can say that, but he has pictures sitting right next to them in Cabo. So, I mean, you can say what you want, but it lines up with exactly what was said today. Anyways, go ahead. Um, yeah, so ultimately it comes down to money, right? I think we just, you know, there's a, there's a report that just came out about what Justin Jefferson's potential deal is going to be. And it, it's big, like it's a big deal. And I don't think Brandon, Ayuk like thinks that he's that much that far away from these upper echelon guys. And I think he, he understands that, you know, the reason why he might not be in the same uh, conversation as some of these guys is because he gets a fraction of the opportunity that these guys get. Right. We, you know, I think on, on your show, um, Jesse, I, I mentioned about, you know, his yards, compared to the amount of targets he gets. And if he got the targets of some of the top guys, he'd be out gaining all of these guys. Right. And, and I think that's a, that's a big deal. And he understands that I can understand from his perspective as well. Like what's there to talk about, right? All you're going to try to talk to me about is getting the number lower. <laughs> right. And he doesn't want, he doesn't want that. He wants to um, get the highest amount of money that he, he could get what he thinks he deserves. And I think that we're hearing all the right things like Lynch, Shanahan, all these guys know how important Brandon Ayuk is. Um, but to me, I, I just, the thing that I think was a little bit different for me was when the report came out saying that, that they'd be okay with him playing on his fifth year option. And to me, that is where I was like, whoa, so maybe this thing, won't get resolved type of thing because I don't think I remember them saying that well Debo wouldn't have gotten a fifth year option but I, I haven't heard them say that about for yeah their their first round players before where they're like yeah we're okay with them playing on the fifth year option because ultimately that means they could leave because the four downers don't franchise tag people ultimately they could leave for nothing kind of thing so I don't know I think it is a little bit squeamish like in the sense that I would like a much cleaner resolution, but I think both sides are doing what's best for them at the moment. And, you know, hopefully just like all these other deals we've seen before training camp, it gets solved. I, what is your sense? Because I do think it does get resolved. If Debo can legitimately request a trade, which is what happened just two short years ago, two short off seasons ago, they got offered a first round pick for him. I think that this one can and will get figured out before training camp. Do you get that sense as well? Maybe I won't say before training camp, but just before the season starts, I, I feel like this one will get figured out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the issue becomes is they just paid Debo. So yeah. that's why it's a little bit different, right? Because, you know, I, I don't know the numbers. I mean, I don't think that you could keep both of these guys long term. Like, so, Ultimately, I think if they if they end up signing BA to the contract, which I do think they should, I think mm -hmm. the, the, the I think the stopwatch starts on how long Debo is a 49er. Um, just like Marco's saying right there, I think ultimately that's that's what it is. Like if they go all in on BA, which I think they should, that means Debo isn't gonna be a 49er much longer. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think that they're going to make have to make a decision here soon. It's interesting, but I started thinking about what's to come for the 49ers, and I couldn't help but to get to next offseason and what things are going to look like. We saw that they moved on from Armstead this offseason. I think next offseason is going to be maybe the most interesting offseason that we've been a part of as far as talking about the team and, and doing this here on the channel, because they're going to have to make decisions like that with guys like Debo and Hargrave and Kittle, so forth and so on. Trent Williams, we'll see what he decides to do. But also, 
they're going to look at the Purdy contract and we're going to figure out a lot about what they think of Brock Purdy. What do they pay him? How many years are guaranteed? There's so many little things that are going to happen next year as this team transitions to the next set of stars. Guys like Brandon Ayuk hopefully are signed and he fits into that mold, but it gets very, very interesting, I think, next offseason, more so than any of these offseasons. Quarterback drama aside, this next offseason is going to be the offseason to really pay attention to. So there's a lot of change coming to San Francisco. I believe that. But I, I do believe that Ayuk will be a part of this team long term. At least I hope he is. Yeah, I mean... I think it's a simple decision between BA and D Debo. If that's the decision they're they're ultimately making, you got to go BA. He's younger, more pure at the at the um, wide receiver position, and obviously his ability to block is super important in the run game. So to me, it's a no brainer. Yeah. Well, gosh, dude, I'm not reading the whole thing, but I'll put it up there for you. I don't know. It'll probably brag a lot if they win one. But if they win one, I don't care, dude. I really don't care. Just like when Jimmy Garoppolo was the quarterback, and people knew what I thought of Jimmy. I said if Jimmy were to win a Super Bowl, that they can put a statue out front of Levi Stadium and give him a lifetime contract for all I care. I don't care. Win a Super Bowl, and then you can say and do whatever you want. I don't care. Just get the damn ring. Please. It's been way too long. Please. Okay, we got to talk about this O-line situation because I think even the biggest supporters of Kyle, Sunil, here's looking at you, kid, <laughs> would say that the offensive line needs to be improved. Okay, it's been a little bit too long. And I took these excerpts from an article that was written by Grant because it's got the full questions written out and it's got the full answers written out. So I wanted to make sure that I got it right word for word so that there is no question as to what is being said. So I'm going to read two questions and two answers from Shanahan. The first question was, you guys have brought back your entire offensive line. How much does that continuity lead you to believe that the line will be better from day one and continue to grow? Shanahan said, yeah, I think the more our O-line played together, the better it got. It's the one position on the field where five guys really have to work a lot in practice and in the offseason to OTAs, to training camp, to throughout the year. You watch our O-line usually in the last half of the year compared to the first. It usually gets better if you can stay healthy. We've been able to do that for the most part. Excited to get everyone back. We'll always keep looking to add through the draft and things like that, get some more competition in there, but been really happy with our group. The follow-up question was, why did you sign Colton McKivitz to an extension? Shanahan said, he's done a hell of a job at right tackle for us. We have a lot of confidence in him going into this year. He's the exact type of guy we want. He's one of the real leaders on our team. I thought he did a hell of a job playing this year. That sounds like a guy who's very content with the offensive line as is. So all of these ideas of them drafting a guy super high and starting him, maybe they still will, depending on how the draft starts. But man, I fear what Ryan said a couple months ago is starting to come true, which is the starting five from last year is going to be the starting five again this year. That sucks. What are your thoughts? Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, that was the safest bet to have because even where they draft, you're not all guaranteed a bona fide starter at offensive line either, right? Like, usually you got to be, you know, unless, you know, you got a guy like Creed Humphreys with, unfortunately, the 49ers could have had. But those type of guys aren't falling into the second and third round and just becoming, you know, bona fide starters right away. Usually it's, you know, top 20 guys that end up being the type of starters. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I do think that the offensive line is has the most room opportunity to grow. I also do think that the, the, the fan base, you know, 
trashes the offensive line more than they they should. Like I I think the offensive line isn't the greatest, the strength of the of the 49ers uh team. But I also think it's not as bad as the fan base says. Because ultimately, this team was able to get to a Super Bowl with this offensive line, so it can't be super trash. They were able to have, you know, the the league leader in rushing, you know, offensive, you know, like air passing. Like Brock Purdy had an MVP caliber season. Christian McCaffrey had MVP caliber season. Both of those guys are relatively dependent on the offensive line, so it can't be super garbage. Now, I think that. From a coaching perspective, you can't sit there and trash your guys, right? Like if someone is asking a direct question about a player on your team, he can't sit there and be like, oh, you know, well, we're looking at a way to replace him through the draft. Like they're not going to say that. Now, once again, is it the messaging that the fan base wants to hear? I, I Obviously not. You can tell by the comments in, in, in the comment section, but ultimately I think – the dis- we'll get to see how they really feel by what they do in the draft. And based off of all of the interviews they did um, during the combine, Jesse, with how many offensive linemen they interviewed, I think it was like the the most amount of, at any position that they interviewed. That doesn't look to me as a team that's not looking to pick quite a few offensive linemen in this draft. So ultimately I do think that they understand that, whether or not they feel like they need to get better, I do think believe they think they do know they need to get younger there, possibly cheaper there, and uh, to be able to continue, you know, growing and having success um, with this offense. So, I think this is more kind of watch and see what they do in the draft to ultimately find out exactly how they feel about their offensive line. Absolutely. Well, Steve, I want to point this out. It says, weird, the Niners have the seventh fewest sacks in the NFL and the rushing leader. Line must be trash. First of all, I don't know that anybody said the line was trash. It's definitely not. There's a lot of people saying that. There's a lot of people saying that. Trash is the word that they use when they talk about. Well, okay. That's fair. That's fair. Because trash is like barbershop talk. I get it. Okay. But. A lot of those non-sacks are on Purdy. A lot of those are on quarterbacks. We automatically assume that high sack numbers are always an offensive line problem or low sack numbers are because an offensive line is good. That is not the case. Justin Fields is a great example of this where it's, oh my gosh, the offensive line is horrible. He's been running for his life. But if you watch Justin Fields play, he runs into sacks all the time. Same thing happened with Russell Wilson. All of a sudden, a similar offensive line looked much different when Russell Wilson wasn't behind it. Brock Purdy does a really good job of avoiding sacks. Brock Purdy does a really good job of getting the ball out quickly so that sacks don't happen. Ultimately, the offensive line, when you spend, you look at what they've spent capital-wise. You've got one first-rounder and Trent Williams, by the way, your best offensive lineman. You've got a second-rounder right next to him, by the way, your second best offensive lineman. And then you have a bunch of guys who were late draft picks or haven't played in the league up until this last year. And that's where the struggles happen. It all depends on the capital you spend. Now, yes, you can get lucky with a late round draft pick, but you look at the capital spent and where the O-line has its strengths and banks and Trent versus maybe the middle to the right, you can tell That's because you're not bringing in a bunch of blue chip guys. So the offensive line is not the worst in the league, but it certainly, if you think that it's a top seven offensive line based off of what you've given or actually higher, I, I, I don't know what you're watching brother. And that's not a shot at you. I'm just saying what I guess my question to you, Steve-O is what are you trying to say with these numbers? Are you trying to say that this offensive line is, is a top 10 offensive line? Because I would highly dispute that. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at even the Super Bowl game, I I, I agree. Like, when push came to shove in the important moments, you know, Chris Jones had his way. Like, he made it harder for Brock Purdy to be able to, to make the plays that he needed to make to be successful. But if you look at the overall game, 
and you look at the numbers, the Kansas City Chiefs offensive line had way more of a struggle than the 49ers offensive line did. If you just look at pressures and all that type of um, the stats that show, uh, you know, who's getting to the quarterback more. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, if are you talking about in the Super Bowl? Yeah. Right. But two things factor into that one, their best offensive lineman was out. That's a big deal. That'd be like if Trent was out and we said, Hey, well, let's compare the two. Their best offensive lineman was out and their offensive line was going against our defensive line. I love Jones. I think he's phenomenal, but outside of Jones, they had two of their top defensive linemen injured. The 49ers had a, a healthy defensive line. I just feel like, we can look well, at those numbers, but they're very about, skewed. But I don't think I don't think what I'm saying is the numbers are the numbers, regardless of how they played out. I don't think that most fans would if if we put that up as a as a question, Jesse, who had which offensive line allowed the most pressures? I think most people would say the 49ers offensive line did, and mm -hmm. they would be wrong. And that's what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, when you put it into context perspective, fine, you could break it down and be like, well, it happened because of this. But ultimately what happened did happen. I think it would be criminal if the 49ers don't allot first or second round picks to the offensive line. I agree with you that they don't have a lot of first and round picks on the offensive line because they haven't had any first or second round picks in the last two, three years. Right. So um, I, I, I just, I think that sometimes when these type of questions are asked, especially from a coach talking about players that are on the team, you have to be somewhat um, political when you're answering that. Ultimately, it is an offensive line that has been to multiple NFC Championship games, been to a Super Bowl. So, yeah, is he okay with this offensive line? I would say, yeah, he's content just because he knows what they, he knows they could get to a Super Bowl with it. But I, I don't think that they're going to stand pat and not look for upgrades in the first and second round this draft. If they do, then, you know, you guys could call me out on the show uh, right after the draft about it. But I, I don't think he would take it that far. We'll see. I think if they draft an offensive lineman round one, then that will be very helpful towards – maybe some of our thoughts and then we'll see what happens in camp. Obviously the best man should get the starting job, regardless of whether that was the first round pick or not. Hopefully if you've drafted him in the first round, he can win a starting job from some of these guys on the right side. But yeah, you're right. We'll see. I just hope that they don't get in a situation where they aren't drafting an offensive lineman in the first two rounds. And you're right. Ultimately, if they were looking to replace someone, they're not going to say that they're not going to come outright and say that, but I don't, I don't know that, that Kyle's playing coy here. I really don't. I think that he is totally content with this offensive line. So, But we'll see. We'll find out in the draft. I just, I don't know, man. It worries me. It worries me a lot. I mean, we'll I, I just think that, you know, they have picked, like, what, so if they had Mike McGlinchey, they re-signed Mike McGlinchey, they'd have three guys with number one or number two draft picks. That's not going to make anybody happy. You know what I mean? So they 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 just didn't have they 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 swung and missed when it came to Trey Lance, right? They they traded away a second round to get Christian McCaffrey. I just don't think they've had the assets to be able to replenish the way that they need to. Um, this is the first year in what two three years that they have a first round pick. We'll see if they don't. Then yeah, you guys are right, but I just think that they will. This may be true, but he also has arguably the best interior offensive line in the whole NFL. <laughs> you can't have five elite offensive linemen, but if three of your five are very, very good, then I'll take that. Right now, we have one that's very good. We have one that's elite. We have one that's probably above average, and then three guys that are below average. They have two guys that are below average, one that's elite, and two that are very, very good. Their O line is fantastic up the middle. So, yeah, you're not, you, nobody's asking for a perfect offensive line, but man, I sure would take three, three really good ones over what we've got personally. I don't know. 
And they could solve that in this draft. They certainly can. In fact, mock draft did yesterday. We solved the whole thing in one, <laughs> one draft. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah, so I, I just... I think we got to just wait and see, but I get it. I, I understand the fans that are, that are, you know, upset about it. Like Jed York, Kyle Shanahan, like their messaging isn't one that the fans want to hear, but we got to just see what moves they make. Yeah, most certainly. Brother Bob says, Sunil, you're still flaking on the bucket of chicken. <laughs> What's up? You avoiding this bucket of chicken? Nah, man, I still want to see brother Bob, but now he's sick. <laughs> we'll do it this week, my man. I'm free. <laughs> Steve-O says every team has two to three holes. I agree. What holes are you okay with? For for me, Steve-O, for me, there's three things that I would love to be very good at, if possible. And if I was going to have a holes, like holes on a team, it would be at skill positions. The way that I look at it is, and I've said this a million times, but I'll reiterate it again. The NFL drafts a certain way. The NFL pays free agents a certain way. And that area is usually quarterback, protecting the quarterback, getting after the quarterback. So for me, you want to be very good at the quarterback position and you want to be solid in the trenches. Everything else can be secondary, in my opinion. That's the way I would build the team. The 49ers, not for a lack of trying, by the way. They, they tried for the quarterback. They've now got Brock Purdy, which is a major upgrade. So it's not as if they haven't tried. You, you can't knock them for trying and missing. They, they made the attempt. They have done a great job at making the attempt over and over on the defensive line. They've paid guys in a big way. They've drafted high there. So not mad at them there. But when you look at the offensive line as far as drafting, Okay, McGlinchey, that's your one guy, essentially. Now, they traded for Trent Williams, which was great, but they've sat back in a year that we thought they could have used help last offseason. They waited. In fact, they didn't even draft an offensive lineman last year. Now, here they are again. We'll see what they do in the first two rounds. If they take offensive linemen, then no, no problem. But for me, having the elite wide receivers and all these elite weapons around Brock Purdy, I would give up some of that to get a very good offensive line and protect Brock Purdy. That's me personally. All right. Let's talk a little bit about free agency because essentially free agency is done for the most part. It's lost its luster. However, the 49ers did bring in a safety last week, a very good safety in Blackman. They haven't signed him. Sounds like they made it clear that if he were to sign, that he would be in a position to compete for a starting job. Maybe that's not what he wanted to hear. He wants a starting job, which I would understand. He's been a starting safety his whole career. Should the 49ers simply be done in free agency, at least through the draft at this point? Should they just focus on the draft and then turn their sights back to free agency to fill whatever holes? Or would you like to see them still be active bring in a guy or two, and then attack the draft. How would you like to see them go about this? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's still a lot of good players out there, Jesse. That's what's interesting because I don't know if it's usually like this where there's that many quality players still available in free agency. Maybe these guys are kind of waiting for after the draft to see who really needs them so they can maximize their money. Um, but there's a lot of good corners out there. There's you know, some good safeties out there. But ultimately, I think the 49ers are kind of set. I don't want them necessarily to throw some money at any of these free agents that are out there. I think that, you know, we've heard that we've heard multiple reports about they're potentially trying to get Greg Newsom from the Browns. You know, that would be nice if they could bring him in, right? But ultimately, I think right now it's just, see if any of these guys are willing to come at a team friendly deal or wait for the draft. Cause ultimately I think that you mentioned that next off season is going to be extremely important. I don't think they, you saw by the way that they're doing deals right now, they're not trying to leverage themselves past 2025 with anybody that's injury prone or older um, when with these free agent deals. So I think they have a plan. And I think if, 
these guys aren't willing to play to the terms that the 49ers are willing to give them. I think ultimately they're just going to focus on the draft and replenishing their depth there and look for the stars of the future, which I'm, I'm completely content with. Yeah, I, I think there is a, a lot of players out there to be had. At this point, focus on the draft. Also, post June 1st, more money will free up because of the way they decided to attack the Eric Armstead situation. Don't necessarily agree with that one, but that's the way that they've done it, which means more money will free up. Also, these players, as the season gets closer, they often get more desperate. They're willing to take the one-year prove-it deals for very inexpensive price, incentive-laden deals to try to prove that they can still be the guys. So you'll see some surprises. You'll see a Simmons sign for two million base salary that could be worth up to ten million, depending on how much he plays and how well he plays. Or guys like him, talented, big name guys that are still available, but teams have just waited and they filled out their roster through the draft and they're kind of forcing these players' hands to take these cheap contracts. That's exactly what the 49ers need to do. So I agree with that. Figure out what you're going to get in the draft. You're building for the long term. Whoever you sign in free agency likely is going to be a one-year deal anyways. So don't sign a guy now and then abandon that position in the draft because you think you've got it figured out. Draft the best guys available, then let's go from there, figure it out. I do think safety might be a position, ultimately, that they do sign a guy versus drafting a guy. Because next year's safety class is supposed to be very good as well. We will see. But ultimately, now's the time to just kind of sit on your hands, prepare for the draft, and then figure it out afterwards. There's going to be plenty of guys that are out there that can help this team. Every year it happens. Not only before training camp, but players go down in training camp. Players go down the first couple weeks of the season. And then guys are available to be signed for very, very cheap price incentive laden deals this will be no different there's plenty of players out there you good you good you and me yeah yeah, good. yeah good. absolutely bro you said it you All said right, it great <laughs> i see i see marco and t-dub going back and forth about this draft yeah i think ultimately you are drafting the prospect you're not you nobody knows for sure who's going to pan out in 10 to 15 years if if it was that easy everybody would nail the draft but you're drafting the prospect and based off the prospects this crop of prospects is one of the better o-line drafts that the nfl has seen in many many years all the experts are talking about it everybody's talking about it. It's not a surprise. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be a hit. Maybe a lot of these guys flop, and in 10 years, we're going to look at it and say, okay, it wasn't a great old line draft, but prospect for prospect, and that's what you're drafting is a prospect. This is supposed to be a very, very good old line draft. So now, now it's time. Hopefully they get some. Multiple, please. I would love that. <laughs> All right, y'all. Listen, it was a great show. Appreciate you joining me as always, Sunil. Everybody in the chat, much love to you. Hopefully you all have a blessed night. I'll be back tomorrow night. I think we're going to do a call-in show. So if there's anything that you want to talk about, tomorrow night is the night to get it off your chest right here on Last Second Sports. We'll talk to you then. Peace.